Welcome to this week's edition of Virtual High School Media Day. I'm Andy Conti, Director of the Center for Media Innovation at Point Park University. And I'm super excited to be joined by an old friend, Zlati Meyer, who is a reporter with Fast Company in New York City. Zlati, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me, Andy. I appreciate it. So tell us, what exactly is Fast Company and what do you do there? Sure. So Fast Company is a magazine, print product, as well as a website that focuses on uh, innovation, creativity, and design in the business world. I'm one of the news reporters, so I do a lot of uh, quick hit stories, uh, breaking news type of pieces. Okay. So like, what's a typical story that you've done recently? A uh, typical story that I've done recently would probably include... Um, uh, I've done a lot of things about the food sector, like fake meat, plant-based meat, essentially, is what it is, which, of course, is very innovative in the food space, right? Meat that isn't made of cows is, oh, my gosh. Um, I've done, I did an interesting story about the increasing use of um, non-traditional pronouns in the business space, so people who um, opt to use they or them as a singular pronoun, which sometimes throws people off, grammarians or just people in social conversation and things like that. And so when you, when people hear business reporters, sometimes they think like, oh, that sounds super boring, but what, how do you keep it interesting? How do you keep it cool? How do you get people into it? Sure. It's not all soybean futures. I, I think that everything really comes down to business, whether you're covering education or entertainment or real estate or politics, it all comes down to money. And I think that once you sort of find that, sometimes it helps. Ultimately, it comes down to what are you paying at the grocery store? What are you paying uh, in your uh, property taxes? So when you start talking about wallets and pocketbooks, people all of a sudden perk up. Yeah. What about high school students? What would you tell them about business? Well, you know, high school students uh, traditionally worked at malls, for example, and we now know that the American mall is on the way out. I mean, now it's completely dead because of coronavirus. Is it worth it to take out $300,000 to go to Harvard as opposed to a uh, cheaper school where, um, particularly if you're going to go on to grad school, so that's something to think about also. And then down the road, even for high school students, you're going to want to move out of the dorm or out of your parents' house and get an apartment. What does that mean to real estate? And tell us a little bit about your office, because you were telling me, like, just how crazy it is with the, like, all the perks in your office. Yeah, it's a very millennial office. We have flavored seltzer. Everybody walks around with their ironic little Calvin and Hobbes tattoos. This office is a little oasis of hipness is in the middle of New York City's financial district, which of course is a very straight laced white shoe area. Uh, so it's really an interesting juxtaposition. You can just go get food whenever you want. There's like, go It's not it. food, it's just drink. <laughs> Although there are free bagels on Friday. Um, so that's a nice perk. And, uh, and like, it's a lot of like camaraderie and like, you know, after hour social hours at the local craft brew club craft brew pub and things like that so it's 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 not uh it's not your father's okay. magazine as as well, Oldsmobile well tell us so yeah. you decided I, I heard you you decided to be a journalist like when you were in fifth grade or something like that so I did yes I did I wanted to be a journalist since uh fifth grade that's my first tangible memory of it um I grew up in Boston and there was a anchor by the name of Liz Walker who I believe is no longer in journalism and I wanted to be Liz Walker when I grew, grew up I worked for the school newspaper I actually had a radio show with a friend of mine who I'm still in touch with called Fetching with Mark and Zlati, which was basically like a Saturday Night Live audio equivalent. We did like funny skits. We had music, that sort of thing. Um, and then my first job out of college was um, at Court TV, which at the time was in the midst of the big O.J. Simpson trial. So that was sort of talking about trial by fire. It was like, you're in, and, and that's what it was. Um, but like I said, really as early as high school, I, I started thinking about internships uh, and uh, paid and unpaid. Uh, in college also, I, I focused on um, what classes would help me do what I wanted to do. A lot of the students are gonna be watching this are not gonna be journalists. Uh, they're gonna be doing other things, but those skills translate, right? They certainly do. I think first among them is strong writing skills. Again, that will really serve you in any profession, whether you're going to be a, a teacher or an administrator, certainly a lawyer, a psychologist, um, and even in, in professions you wouldn't necessarily think of it. A writing skill is something that once you have it, it will be yours forever, 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 forever. Um, and you could even be, you know, that, uh, I don't know, chef that on the side writes a book. Well, good for you. You have the writing skills. Another thing is sort of that skepticism. So many people um, just, you know, are told something and they, they, they take it for granted. A journalist is sort of trained to think, well, 
you said it was 60%, but is 60% actually like three out of five people? And therefore, it's, you know, so you sort of have to think out of the box a little bit, perhaps like, like, like a chess player. I think another skill, uh, thirdly, is research. Journalists have to, you know, come prepared to interviews. They have to um, be prepared to ask questions, ask follow-up, and know who to go to as the expert to sort of counterbalance the reporting you've done. So sort of that ability, you know, to think, um, smartly, again, will will serve you well. I would say those are probably the big three. It's, it's really, like I said, like a college degree. Once they hand you that diploma, it's yours forever. They cannot pry it out of your hands, ever. So tell us about some of your best assignments. Like, what was your, your favorite assignment ever? What have you, what's the coolest thing you've gotten to do as a journalist? Uh, well, the coolest thing I've ever gotten to do as a journalist is cover some um, presidents, some U.S. presidents. Um, which, just to be serious for a moment, I'm the um, granddaughter of th of four um, immigrants, and um, uh, one of them was a Holocaust survivor. Two of them were uh, refugees from Nazi Germany, and it really struck me as like amazing. Like here I am within ten feet of of the most powerful person on earth. Um, so that was really very exciting. This is when I was in Detroit. Um, and um, different presidents came to Detroit for different reasons. There's the car show, somebody came to make a speech, whatever. Uh, but that I really enjoyed. I also had an opportunity to report um, on September 11th. I was in Philadelphia at the time. That was obviously a very moving um, story to cover. And I heard on the radio, which again, it was only about like 80 or so miles from New York City, so I was able to pick up the New York stations. They said a plane had crashed into the World Trade Center. And I assumed this was about five years after John F. Kennedy's plane went down. And I just assume, oh, it's like some celebrity, you know, like Matthew Broderick or somebody thinks he's a pilot and hits the trip. And as I'm getting to work things, it's beginning to unfold that it's a little, you know, it's more than that. It was not the case. It was an intentional. Everyone's you know, frantic. The main newsroom is sending everybody orders. What do we do? What do we do? And I, um, long story short, but it was determined that the pilot of the second plane hit the second tower. Um, was from Bucks County, Upper Bucks County, which was my area. This was not exactly my area, but I was close to this. It's Lati, you go to Buck, it's, you go to the pilot's house. You know, we got the name, we put it in Nexus, we got the address. You go to the pilot's house. Now, as I'm driving, this this is this is what I'm thinking. Every person in America with a loved one who was supposed to be on one of those planes, or was supposed to be in the World Trade Center, or was at work at the Pentagon, was still had an opportunity to do what I call mental gymnastics. Mm, maybe she stopped for coffee. Maybe he overslept and missed the plane. This woman knew that if that plane took off, it, it, her husband was, at, I don't think they have wheels on planes, but he, they, they, he was at the controls. And this was, and probably you guys who are in high school obviously did not live through it, so you don't remember, but it was this footage they were showing over and over and over and over again of the second plane hitting the second tower. And so here she is with the rest of America watching her husband die over and over and over again. I mean, you can imagine this woman's mental state. She was, I, I probably in shock and did not, I, 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 can't, I don't, wouldn't even want to put myself in her shoes for a moment. So I drive up to the house. I forgot if I knocked the door, rang the bell, whatever. And a woman comes to the door. I don't know if it was her, if it was her mother, her sister-in-law, her best friend, her pastor's wife, whatever. And I said, hi, I'm Slotty Meyer from the Phillip. And I didn't even finish. And the woman just looked at me and closed the door in my face, oh. which obviously it was what was gonna happen. And I felt like, like like something that you scrape off the bottom of your shoe. At the same time, I'd like to think that on some level, you know, that, that's what journalists are. That was, I was representing, you know, I, I, I don't even know, you know, the, 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 the paper, the, the uh, Americans that wanted to know what, what was going on, what are you thinking? So that was an assignment that certainly is seared in my memory, not one that obviously, I rejoice in, but that was that was sort of like probably one of my most moving assignments and therefore most memorable. Your story about 9-11 was it's a great example of, um, you know, it's one of those assignments that reporters hate. I remember I had to go to somebody's house one time after the this guy had died in an industrial accident and I, I got his his widow and I, you know, was with the first reporter there and I said his name wrong. I got his name wrong and she was like, you don't even you couldn't even get his name right. So it's yeah, it's always a challenge as a reporter, but I think on the the plus side. You know, you never know what your your day is going to be like. For me, that was always very exciting as as a journalist to think I go into work and I don't know what's going to happen. I might end up at a fire or a murder scene, or I might be you know doing some investigative piece on the mayor. Whatever it is, you don't really know. Has that been true for you? 
It is. I always said, I, I sort of liken it to like an ER doctor as opposed to a cardiologist, right? A cardiologist sees you every year for your annual checkup. Hopefully there's no problem. Oh, good to see you, Mr. Conte. And that's it. An ER doctor sits and waits, whatever rolls through the door. And sometimes it's, you know, the seven-year-old that stuck a piece of Lego up their nose. And sometimes it's a multi, you know, a, a multiple gunshot or somebody's impaled on the top of a fence or something, you know. Uh, and other times it's, well, they're raising municipal sewage rates. So explain to them how that is calculated. Uh, so I, I enjoy that. Obviously, that's relative, but I think if you can walk in, you know, give them polished sentences, uh, no basic rules of grammar, be able to sort of craft a nice narrative, they will love you. So I know you're on maternity leave right now, but what is the situation at Fast Company with the coronavirus? And are you, do you know what's going on at the office? Are people working remotely? What's the story? Everyone is working remotely, um, both at Fast Company and our sister magazine, Inc., which is INC, period, not Inc., like tattoos. And I don't know how the, the, the print magazine, the actual production people, because those people to a degree have to, I guess, be at the presses or something. I, I don't know. I've never really engaged in that air section of, of journalism. Um, but it's sort of business as usual. Um, they did talk about the importance of balancing your uh, personal life, your home life. So it sounds like they're really doing a good job of sort of balancing the two. I mean, it's, 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 uh, it's unprecedented. I mean, there's no there's no way, even in the days after 9-11, it's not like it was today. It was like a ghost town. It was like an abandoned movie set. There was like nobody on the street. I mean, this is one of the busiest cities on the planet. Um, these huge towering um, office buildings, I can, I assume, completely vacant. It, it, it was shocking. It looked like, uh, like almost like a nuclear wasteland. It, it was unbelievable. And that's it's being replicated around the country. I imagine London looks like that, Toronto, all these big world-class cities. You mentioned 9-11 before, and I think it's hard for high school students to, you know, they, to imagine what that was like, because it, it's so different as before their uh, lifetimes. But this is as close to that 9-11 feeling, I think, where the entire country, and in this case, the entire world is really on edge. Nobody really knows what to expect next. And you have those moments that are, are going to be etched in history forever and that people will never forget. I agree. And I think that you high school students, I mean, you, you obviously can't think, let's say, 15 years down the road, but you know, one day your children are going to ask you, what did you do during Corona, Mommy and Daddy? Just the way... Um, Andy, you, and I, I know I certainly did would talk to my parents about, you know, where they were when they heard Kennedy was shot, for example, which is another ex example that sort of had worldwide implications. And, and please know that, uh, I mean, obviously it took a long time for, nine, for us to bounce back from 9-11. Different aspects came back sooner than others. We, we were still dealing with the ripple effect. Anyone who's traveled by plane in the past 19 years knows that. And I think that this will we will also see the ramifications for a long, 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 long time afterwards, whether we everyone gets out of this social distancing, self-quarantine thing in, what are they saying, 45 days? I saw an estimate in the Atlantic between 12 and 18 months. I mean, businesses are going to go belly up, small ones, large ones. Will the government bail us out? The, my husband's Canadian. The border to Canada is closed. One of the things we're recommending, and one thing we're actually doing at my house, is just taking some time to journal about this moment, uh, because it's... It, it is one of those times that, like you said before, you're not going to remember it like you're living it. And so if, you, if you're if you at home and you're not at school and you're thinking, what am I going to do? Spend a little time to just write down what it feels like. Go and take photographs, you know, in your around your house, your neighborhood. Uh, chronicle this moment a little bit. We, we've started a scrapbook at my house. And we even have like the grocery store receipts where we put in like everything that we, cause we went out and we still didn't get any toilet paper, but everything else we hoarded, yeah. uh, we put that in, in the, the scrapbook. So definitely do that. It's going to be something you, you won't regret later. Uh, Zlati, just to wrap up any last advice for young people today in terms of you know, thinking about their careers or just the things that they want to do, because what we hear often is that young people, they, they have the technical skills. They know how to use their smartphones to tell stories uh, but it's always a question of like, what kinds of stories do they tell and how do they turn that into a career? Do you have any thoughts? Sure. Well, I think it's very important for a person to do what they love. I mean, the average workday is eight hours. It's a 24 hour day. So you're spending, spending about, a, a li obviously weekends make it not perfect, but about a third of your um, adult life working. So definitely pick something that you love. Um, something that pays well also works well, which is not necessarily journalism. So <laughs> 
you may re want to rethink from from that perspective. But you know, I, I, like I said, I'd rather um, cartwheel my way to the office every morning, to the newsroom every morning, than have a million diamond necklaces and, and be an accountant with all due respect to accountants. My father was a professor of accounting, so I, I, but I would, I would never, ever, ever want to be an accountant. I think it's important to do what you love and um, whatever it is that you do, excel at it. You talk about, I mean, anyone can sort of chronicle what's going on, but there's, you know, the way a, you know, one man website in, I, I don't know what state, does it versus the New York Times. There are different levels of doing things. So just really try and be the best that you can be and always embrace the opportunity to learn more, whether it's your exact sphere of your profession or whether it is um, just a, a hobby enrichment. You never know where that knowledge will take you. And like I said before, with regard to writing skills, with regard to college degree, once it's, it, what's it, once it's yours, whether it's encyclopedic knowledge of, of I don't know, canoes or Star Wars, it, it's yours forever. And it, and it will serve you well in some weird way. Okay. Well, Zlati, thanks for being here today. And thanks to everyone for watching this edition of Virtual High School Media Day. Be sure to check in next Friday for the next show. Thank you.